Hello and welcome. We are live. Now, thank you for joining us today for the webinar is focused on sales process. And even though sales can, for many, be a dirty word within the accounting and advisory profession, it really is a common thread of successful firms is that they're good at it. And today I'm joined by two other people who are incredibly well placed to talk about this topic. So Streamline Your Sales Process for Prospective and Existing Clients is the title. And I'm joined by Trent McLaren of Practice Mission and Richard Francis of Spotlight Report Reporting. And I'm Anthony Carter, founder of Practice Paradox. But first, I'll ask you, Richard, a little bit of background for those who have not met you before. Thanks, MC. Yeah, most of the people on the webinar probably know me as CEO of Spotlight Reporting, uh, Zero's number one reporting and forecasting app. But uh, back in the day, I was a uh, CA doing advisory work, both uh, for a big firm and then for my own boutique firm here in NZ. So yeah, I've been in the trenches probably for 20 plus years now. Yeah, beautiful. So you've been in the trenches and also helping people in the trenches. So you've seen it from both sides. Absolutely. Which is perfect. Thanks, Richard. And Trent? So I've been uh, in the software, accounting software space for nearly six years. I was in a payments space. So I had a little bit of time with the guys at QuickBooks before um, stepping into a global role with Practice Ignition, which focuses heavily on uh, removing that friction between accountant and client. So I think in terms of the, the topic, this is kind of our bread and butter. This is what we talk about and do in, you know, day in and day out with, uh, with accountants, bookkeepers, and, and now some professional services all around the world. So, um, you know, admittedly never been an accountant. Um, I think I've got a bit of Stockholm Syndrome because of how many that I hang out with all the time. Uh, I almost feel like I'm part of the, the tribe, although I'm sure I get a, every now and then someone likes to remind me I'm not, so. <laughs> you deal with many hundreds of firms in the country, so you see the sales process, the good, the bad and the ugly of it um, around the world. That's totally. What and my background, if you're new to Practice Paradox, um, I've worked in and around accounting firms since about the mid 19 90s. Uh, I was a co-founder at Business Fitness in 2001, which specializes in efficiency and paperless office for accounting firms. And about eight years ago, I founded Practice Paradox. And we were pretty much the first digital marketing agency to specialize globally in the accounting vertical, just accounting and business advisory firms. So we help businesses generate inbound warm leads, but we also teach what do you then do when you get the inquiries. So let's just have a look, just as a quick sort of uh, heads up, some of the questions that we'll look at today are, what are the major friction points you see and how do you remove those? Uh, how do you win clients over with a great first impression? What does seamless engagement look like to you? Why does it matter in that engagement process? How do you roll in advisory and how do you scale it once you have? Who should be involved in the sales process and what are the most common mistakes seen in the sales process. We'll cover that and probably plenty of other ones as well. So I might start with you, Trent, before I turn off the slides to give everyone a bigger view of us, I'm assuming <coughs> that's a thing, right? Uh, what do you see in the sales process? First to you, Trent, and then to Richard, what do you think are the main friction points in the sales process for firms? I think for a lot of firms, it's actually having a process is a great start. Because a lot of people, phone rings, they pick it up and, you know, then they talk to them. It's like, oh, this is great. But there's no follow-up. There's no what's our next steps, what's our next action point. And I think for me, like I've been lucky enough to work in sales for sort of eight to ten years now. Like it's kind of all, almost all I've ever done. So the, but the first thing you always learn is having a system and having a next action step and a point. Um, and a system doesn't necessarily have to be software. Like, heck, if you're not using anything, at least use an Excel sheet or something that says this is the – contact point, this is the next step. The beautiful part about tech and technology is these days is that it is a hell of a lot easier and you can automate it, you can systemize it and you can actually get it where it's saying, hey, you should probably follow up. Even Google Gmail now says that, hey, you haven't heard back from this person in four days since the last email you sent them. Maybe you should respond. And even that at a really basic level is awesome. But at the end of the day, it's whoever's front and center and whoever you're in front of the most that your client is most likely to go with, if that makes sense. Um, because reality is they can choose any accountant really in their area. But if you're responsive, you're clear and you display that value of what you can bring to them and you're persistent at least, um, you're more often than not probably going to win that client. So step one with the process, have one. 
and be responsive. What about you, Richard? What do you see as issues around sales process for accounting and advisory? Yeah, look, I, th I think it's attitude. So picking up a little bit on Trent's point, we've, we've got the saying in New Zealand, um, less hooey, more dewey. And basically that means let's stop talking about it. Let's actually get out and, and get some shit done. So one of the things I always talk to our spotlight accountants about is just getting off your bum out of your office. If you're a leader in a business, you have to get out there and be the be the front man or woman, really um, represent the brand, go where the antelope roam. So when I started my practice, I went down to the local incubators here in, in Wellington. I did some free stuff. Appreciate that's a four letter F word uh, to a lot of accountants. You know, I did free webinars, I did some free spotlights. Um, but I, I got off my backside, so I know that sounds really simple, but so many accountants fall into the trap of thinking they can do this from their desktop. That they can sit in their office all day, they can send newsletters out and that people are gonna consume them with great delight and, and, and get ringing, um, but they don't. So you've gotta, you know, the sales process is a very human one. You've gotta get out there and uh, grapple with those other humans, because if you're just sitting in your office, you're relying on the ATO or the IRD to be your marketing and sales engine. Spot on. I like that phrase. What was it? Go where the antelope roam. Absolutely. Yeah. So get out there, network in places where you're likely to meet your ideal types of clients. So for you, it was incubators. So you were interested in working with startups. I wanted the startups who were ambitious and wanted to grow. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. And you know, a point to build on that, and uh, a take-home point for everyone. We've had a few so far. You know, have a documented process, and we'll, today we'll give you some specific tips on what that process should be. Um, but with your networking, is to have a really clear, whatever you want to call, the words that come from your mouth when people ask you to stand up and you know explain what you do. You know, and have different versions of that for different contexts, and have different versions for different people in your team. Not everyone has to say the same thing because different people use different words, different phrases. It's got to feel natural. You got to practice it. You got to role play it. And we teach that at our master classes, we have a pitch it to me baby session where people get up on stage, they do their elevator pitch, their 30 second pitch, and we then critique it live. And then people get to come up again. It's really interesting seeing the, the evolution on that. So document your pitch so that it works a generic one and then have, I suppose, different ones for different target markets as well. I love that point and I think about it even, I was fortunate enough in one of my earlier roles to do a lot of business networking, go to all of those events where you do stand up, you pitch your wares, who you are, what you're about. And it's because if there's 30 or 40 people in the room and you're all standing up and doing your own 60 seconds, A, that takes a long time, so everyone does zone out. But B, um, you want to try and make sure that people actually understand who it is that you want to speak to. And I think that's really important where that, yeah. that niching element does come into it because I can stand up and say, look, I'm an accountant and you know we service people that need their taxes done, right? And I'm like, well, that doesn't really help because that, I, I don't yes. know anyone off the top of my head. I know a lot of people, but I can't think of anyone specifically that you should talk to. But when I stand up yeah. and say that you know, I'm, um, I'm the hospitality accountant, we only work with cafe owners that really want to drive revenue, profitability, blah, blah, blah. Like, oh, actually, I've got three friends that run cafes and they really struggle. Maybe they should meet you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I find it's be really clear about who you're telling your audience, telling your network that you want to work with. Yeah, the power of that specificity, isn't it? Like be, be prepared to ask. I think there's a little bit of a, an Australasian thing, probably slightly less in Australia, where you guys can sometimes be a little bit more up the guts than we are. Um, but you know, being afraid to ask what you actually want. So if you're going to get out there and network, um, and I, I did this just to share a quick story. When I started Francis Consulting, having been in a big firm running their advisory. So I had I had um, a family by that stage. I had mouths to feed. So I had to get out there and sell. You know, there was no option. I wasn't I wasn't sitting around and waiting. But I went to the local incubator. There was a uh, unnamed big four firm there that was a sponsor, and 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 thought it was their birthright to have all of these cool, trendy um, growth businesses in there. And then where can I just got in there like a virus, and uh, did some free stuff. Got one client. I just asked the guy running the incubator, can I get in there and do some free webinars? and seminars for you for your crew. Um, and I got one client and then the referrals started to come and I ended up with almost the entire incubator as a um, as, as my client base. But you know, I got in there and I asked, I was kind of ballsy enough to do it. And I think accountants sit back and wait, or they might go to a business networking event and as you say, they bumble through um, Trent, you know, they oh I do tax returns. You know, have have your value proposition up front and ask yep. for the work. Because if you've if you've actually bothered to get out there um, out of your office, you're already in the minority. So if you can Absolutely. then articulate it well, gangbusters. 
And it's only one question, right? I think even it's so easy to just not say this because you're not trying to be too pressure. You know, you're not trying to really make it weird for the other person. I was, my always closing thing is like, so what do you want to do next? Like, how do you want to go from here? And let them come back to you saying, okay, well, let me think about it or I need to talk to someone. And for me, that next thing is still really important. Okay, cool. Should I follow up with you sometime next week? Would that work? Would you be happy to have another conversation to assess your needs mm. and where you're at? And the more specific you can be around the next time you will speak yeah. to that person, again, the more effective you'll be. And this is, again, this is just a process. It's not trying to be weird. But if you do this, you know, 100 times compared to, you know, only doing it if it feels right, um, and I think that's part of the failure is it's all about that feeling. And unfortunately, I think for a lot of accountants, uh, that's naturally not where they want to be. That's naturally not what they're called to or how they want to approach it. So being able to um, keep that process in and just have next steps, next action points after every interaction, especially in that sales and BD process, uh, you, you will, again, you, more often than not, you will be more uh, better placed than anyone else that that person has ever spoken to. Trent, yeah, I love how so. you said, um, you know, don't make it weird for the other party. But what I what I hear a lot um, is what what the punters find weird is that the accountants never come back to them. Yeah. So we we hear all the time at Spotlight, oh, this, you know, the, the, we had this um, we're, we're this really cool company, and we went to three or four firms in Auckland or Sydney or wherever that are spotlighting. We never heard back from two of them. And remember, these are the guys who are already in the advisory progressive stage, or you know, they kind of. I was made to feel like this lead I'd given them was, you know, disrupting their tax return uh, trajectory and, you know, they'd get back to me in two or three weeks. So I went with a person who got back within 24 hours, so someone who's mm -hmm. got a process um, yeah. and who was prepared to sit down and listen to me. And so there's so many accounting firms that may have even made the effort to go out and network and get that initial lead or have that great chat and they never follow up. Absolutely. The bottleneck issues, I've seen some, um, you know, very high profile firms that we've worked with over the years and we've identified there've been bottlenecks starting ranging from just taking that first call, like just getting back on the first contact because the yep. partner or the principal has to do that conversation, which is untrue. And I'll share some of our yep. methodology on the front end of the sales process today. And then the bottleneck in getting the proposal done after the meeting. So many people, because we the three of us here do what we do. You know, people come up to you at the barbecues and stuff and go, oh, can, yeah. you know, and they'll they'll share stories. Like, oh God, yeah, I've, I'm shopping around. I've, I've met with three accountants, you know, yeah. three weeks ago, I'm still waiting for two of the proposals. And the other one took a week and a half after I had to call them three times to get it off them. So I think a key part is to design a process that's not dependent on the partners and principals. But I think what would be good, because there's so many aspects to sales here, why don't we just do one of our first two polls, which in a moment, it'll come up for everyone um, to answer, which is the biggest sales process challenge? Communicating the value of your advisory services, or you've become a proposal chaser, or price resistance from tire kickers, or you lack a, a clear structural process, or it's too time consuming to create proposals. So I've just published that. And if everyone could uh, move their mouse and actually vote on this, I'm a little bit of a poll Nazi. You allowed to say Nazi these days? I'm not sure, but I'm going to well, keep look, going I, I um, until <laughs> maybe occasionally. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not, <laughs> maybe not in public in front of people. Um, oh so. yeah, oh yeah, we're in front of a few people. Okay, so we're seeing the results come in uh, live as we speak. So guys, participate in the poll because we, this will enable us to. Um, just tailor what we go to. So the leader, the early leader at the moment is communicating the value of our advisory services. So once most people have voted, I'll then share the results with everyone. Mm. But Richard, um, what would you say around communicating the value of our advisory services? What are some actionable tips on that front? Yeah, it's, it's interesting that we put it in the context of us having to communicate the value, which, which I get, but um, certainly the approach I always took was, um, and having my free session with the with the potential target uh, was listening, taking notes, and and really just absorbing what they were trying to achieve with their business or their family group. So I tended to start right at the beginning with a wider lens than many accountants. Um, and I actually found that during that it was always an hour, the customer or potential customer would actually start selling my services back to me. So, you know, we've, we've, we've really lacked structure and focus. Uh, we don't make enough money, et cetera, et cetera. You can see where it goes and you can start weaving in 
um, I suppose, solutions to that. And then when you go back with the proposal, or even do it um, live, so I used to, uh, this was pre-practice ignition days, Trent, so I didn't have the um, uh, the advantage of being able to use a tool like that. But you'd actually start building out a, a menu with that customer and give some indicative pricing there. And uh, sometimes I'd give a couple of options, or, or even back in the day, as, as horrible as it sounds to say, the bronze, silver, gold options. But I, I think the big mistake accountants make is talking too much. If they listen more uh, and they seek to understand the goals and the drivers of the person they're talking to, half the selling is done by the client. Beautiful. And it really is, when sales is done well, no one feels sold to. If anyone feels sold to, that's a sign that the person isn't actually skilled at sales. It's a conversation process. So yeah. I'll give everyone another take home. With your team, brainstorm on a whiteboard flip chart, all of the questions in a conversation that you actually are interested in knowing about a prospective client. Some of those will be factual things, you know, hard facts, numbers, dates, years, etc., amounts, and others might be more, uh, you know, emotional ones, you know, what's driving them, what's triggered this change, etc. And brainstorm all of those out and document them, mm. and then they can actually um, be a basis for training, role playing. Make sure when you do role plays, guys, um, within your firm, you have someone who's pretending to be the prospective client, someone who's the advisor running it, and video them. Video them because if there's a really good role play, that was great. The way you asked those questions, the way you used those question softeners in the leading before you asked those questions was great. That can become a training video. You can put it into your wiki, into your intranet, and then then use that. So yeah, absolutely. Questions, questions, questions. When I, when I started Francis Consulting, guys, I, I can remember so many times getting clients off other firms uh, and people would say to me, I've moved to you because other firms don't do that. And I was doing business planning and all those other things. And they're all, they're all services offered by those other firms, but no one had sat down and listened and actually tweaked to the fact that this was what they needed. Not you know, Accountants are like this on its numbers, accounts, tax return. If I'm really asked, I might do a forecast or a business plan. Um, and that's because they're not listening, they're talking. Let's just have a look at the uh, the poll results now. So communicating the value of advisory services, out and out, winner there at 64%. Uh, second, lacks a clear structural process at 18%. Third, price resistance from tire kickers, which is interesting, a little bit of a loaded question, that one. Because um, I've often heard people say to us, oh, my clients, they just don't get it. I spoke to them about insert value added optional service here and you know they're, 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 they're uh, price sensitive they just don't get it which is advocating all responsibility for being able to communicate the value so clearly if everyone goes how can I get better at communicating the value it's not the client's fault it's the advisor's role to educate them about it so that's a good step if everyone takes that um, you know control the controllables you can control your communication skills you can't control the client I love that saying. It's always control what you can control, and the rest of it, if it's out of your, if it's out of your reach and you can't do anything with it, then why are you worried about it? Like, why is it something that really drains on you? But if you can impact it somehow or influence or whatever, that's good. But don't bother focusing on something that you literally cannot change, do, or adjust. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not surprising, like, to see that communication is the leading driver because that is something that, again, as I said, not everyone. Um, you know, woke up one day and was able to just speak and chat and do everything that they need to do or being able to articulate um, exactly what they do. And I think we, you know, there's a point that came up, I think MC or Richard, you said earlier about making it simple in layman's terms and being able to really translate exactly what you do uh, in a way that a client gets it and understands uh, as opposed to the mumbo jumbo of. Absolutely. I think, I think if we listen, we filter and then echo back, that's half of the battle. Um, the tie kicker one's interesting. I mean, I've got really limited um, sympathy for that, to be honest. Um, we we all have 24 hours in the day. If we're talking to the wrong people about the wrong services, have a look at who you're attracting and why. I mean, we had a pretty tight acceptance checklist at, at Francis Consulting. We we were, you know, you got spotlight as standard. You get you got monthly mentoring, got a business plan, got a forecast, which is what I think is a bare minimum a proper advisory accounting firm should offer. If you didn't want any of that, you didn't want to invest in that, I had a guy next door who was a compliance jockey, really nice guy. I used to give him those the clients who didn't want to invest. And he got the ones that were really scary who wanted the services that he didn't provide. 
So you can set up that kind of relationship with other accounting firms rather than always going at loggerheads. But the profession needs to get beyond thinking that everyone with a wallet and a heartbeat is a potential client. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I and agree. Before you mentioned the phrase um, value proposition, which I'm passionate about that and we're passionate about teaching accounting firms that because your value proposition is in a nutshell why people should choose you. And people get it confused with, oh, yes, we've got that. And then they show it them to us and it's their client selection criteria. And it says, you know, businesses that have X million dollars in revenue and this many employees and this many years in business and they're good payers, good listeners. Well, get in line, everyone. <laughs> like, who, who doesn't want that? That is from marketing perspective of no use whatsoever. Yeah. So with your value proposition, the structure is what are you doing for whom? Another supporting statement and just three core benefits and benefits are the end results that you help people achieve. It's not naming your services or what you do. It's what you help people achieve. So, um, yeah, that one always am amuses me. Let's um, go to the chestnut that people think, oh, you're either a born salesperson or you're not. You know, you got the gift of the gab and we just uh, talk about it's not about talking. What do you guys think about that? So I've got an interesting one. I used to manage um, and work in retail for quite a long time. And this is where my gift of gab came from because all you're doing is chatting to people every single day. But I remember I've got a really good story of a team member that I um, recruited from another store and he had the, he had the right look. It was a retail store, it was, you know, kind of um, like hip urban fashion type stuff. And he had no. the right look. Yeah. yeah. I don't, I don't. <laughs> anyway, ripped jeans and all. Um, he had the right look, but he didn't, he wasn't an outgoing kind of guy that felt comfortable doing everything he had to do. And it was, uh, and my wife says this to me all the time, is like the transformation he went through just through daily repetition, daily practice, and then having someone to guide him and coach him through to a point where, you know, within three months, he was teaching everyone else how to be, you know, that loud, outgoing, confident person. And you don't necessarily have to be loud, but you just need to understand how to communicate with all different types of people. So whether it's like you said before, Richard, mm. around filtering and echoing back what you've heard, it's mirroring the person you're speaking to in the way that they speak. If I speak to someone that speaks really fast and really detailed, then I probably have a tendency to almost do the same thing back to them uh, in a sense because it just that's how they operate. When I speak to someone who's a bit softer and withdrawn, I will slow down mm. and communicate with them on their level. And I think that's half the battle. It's just about knowing how to read the other person and communicate back with them how they like to be communicated with. So. It doesn't matter if you're not born with the gift of the gab. You, like I've, I've said this before, like you were a really bad accountant or bookkeeper when you started, and you may still be today. But <laughs> with time and practice and making a few errors and mistakes, you got really good at it, right? And communicating your value to clients is just about repetition, and it's just a process. It's something you can learn as long as you try and fail a couple of times. Like you're going to suck at it until you stop sucking at it. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Yeah, to me, it's a it's a skill. And there is a natural aptitude element in there somewhere, just like there might be at a particular sport or singing or a musical yeah. instrument, but everyone can learn the basics. And there is a structure and a science to the psychology of it. Conversation skills can be learned. One thing that I'd recommend to everyone, um, at the end of the day, this a belief that I have is that when people buy advisory, they're actually buying confidence. They're buying the confidence that they are perceiving that you have that you can lead them to a better place. So if they don't um, pick up, and that doesn't mean being arrogant or like um, overtly confident, but they need to feel that you know what you're talking about. And I think the easiest way to build confidence for most people is just learn how to stand up in front of a group and speak. Join a local Toastmasters group, go to Toastmasters a couple of times a month, get up there and practice. And then all of a sudden, the next time you're in a sales meeting with a couple of people, um, you think, well, last Wednesday night I was standing in front of 20 people. It really, I've seen it time and time again, we encourage our team members at Paradox to join a local um, uh, chapter of their Toastmasters and it just oozes then through to one-on-one -on -one conversations. It's not the be all and end all, but I think it's a good um, uh, help for a lot of people. You're right, MC, I think one that, as soon as you say join Toastmasters, I think you scare half the audience off. Um, I, I, I don't believe that's the first step. So I absolutely believe it's trainable. I've, I've worked in big firms and dealt with um, a lot of accountants in, in my years. And there's been very few people, there have been some, that have, have had to be hidden out back with the 20 watt light bulb and you know just left there. Um, but one-on-one, -on -one, teach people how to relate. You know, people, 
in, in advisory, they're buying you as much as your service offerings. You know, mm. they're buying that empathy, they're buying the experience and expertise. But for your team role play, so um, our good friend Steph Hines, as you know, she does a lot of role play. She carves out time every week to do this. Um, I wish I'd done it actually with my team. Um, so she was she was a step ahead of me there. And they sit down and they diagnose the client, uh, and they look at the spotlight and how they would talk, and they bounce things back. So I think just train you, your team and yourself to get out there and talk one-on-one. -on -one. And, and coming back to one of Trent's really early points, if you have a process and a few scripts and a few questions that are your go-to um, and you're prepared to listen, you know, you'll, you'll actually pick it up. And most accountants, um, well, not, not most, many accountants I deal with aren't naturally charismatic Carl, but they can hold... Um, and, and, and know that they need to hold meaningful conversations one-on-one -on -one or with a family group. Uh, the whole stepping up stage bit is the whole other kettle of fish. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, a huge step. What's the line about? It's the uh, biggest fear um, yeah. in life in the book of lists. And as Seinfeld right. says, that means the person giving the eulogy at the funeral would prefer to be in the box. <laughs> you crack me up. I watched that episode the other night. <laughs> oh, did you? Yeah. So um, let's talk about the front end of the sales process. And let's uh, assume you're getting inbound leads. And the first thing I want to just quickly mention there is that if you're getting price sensitive, what you perceive a price sensitive tie kick is not interested in advisory, you've got to go upstream and have a look at your presence, you know, how well are you communicating value in your marketing material, on your website, not just the home page, but the service pages, blog posts, your social presence. Because when you do that well, you'll attract people who are looking for advisory in the first place. And then your marketing machine, when you do content driven marketing, can pre educate them about some concepts that will um, twig with them. And you mentioned Steph Hines of Growthwise earlier, Richard. I remember um, she was the first graduate of our training program on marketing when we started many moons ago. And she was telling a story in a group once where a new client just signed up, signed up to the whole, you know, full service with monthly advisory services. And Steph said, oh, I forgot to ask you earlier, how did you hear about us? And the client said, the brand new client said, yeah, it was a blog post I read um, about nine months ago now about how for a small business, the number one asset is data. And I thought, that caught my attention because I thought, what's an accountant talking about an asset like that? And it was about the cloud. And it was, you know, back then mm. the cloud was very new. And she said, that really stayed with me and opened my eyes. So then that person read more blogs, more blogs, got on the email newsletter, learn about these things. And then by the time Steph spoke to this person, Steph's already perceived in their eyes as, you know, you've already taught me stuff. You're a guru as, as far as I'm concerned. And they're just ready to talk about advisory rather than, you know, that cold lead, that referral who sits there and go, okay, you know, sell yeah. me. As you know well, we receive um, from your background and the services you provide. You can self, you can you can get the right people through the funnel. They can self select. I mean, we called ourselves Francis Consulting, which sounds very grandiose, and consulting wasn't such a bad word back in those days. Um, and we actually had our whole chartered accounting thing almost a bit hidden. So it was all about business growth, profit improvement, family group, da 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 da. And often we had people say, "Are you accountants as well?" Um, so I probably overdid it slightly, um, mm. but but when you come into all those um, accounting websites and the first thing you see is tax returns, PAYG, super, you know, you're almost asleep by the fourth point, um, and you're going to get the people who are going, okay, I want this is a commodity shop, I may as well compare them to the commodity shop up the road. Um, exactly. So you, you've already lost the battle if you've got if you've got advisory hidden on the on the fourth click. Yeah, and. Speaking about the website impression, a classic sign that someone isn't clear on their value proposition is their website has what's um, sometimes called a slider or a carousel where there's a message and an image and then five seconds later it changes to another one and then five seconds later it changes. Uh, that's mm. been categorically shown to hurt the effectiveness of a website in generating leads. It's just proven. And imagine if, you know, one of these networking breakfasts, someone got up and every 10 seconds, they kind of stopped short of what they're saying and then started an up on another angle. <laughs> You'd think they had some sort of disorder. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, people should get super clear and just have a very strong, this is what we're doing for whom, bam. But back to the front end of the sales process, when let's say a call comes in or a contact us inquiry through the website. Trent, what's your view on who inside a firm should handle that in what situations? So 
it depends on the structure of firm. It depends on how big you are. Like if it's just you or you're a small dynamic team and you've got, you know, junior staff and you're the partner, then you might take that call or you may have your team do the profiling questions because it's you can educate anyone to do that first piece, document it, put it in something, CRM, note, any, anything that you can just track. Who is this person? What do I need to know about them? And then decide whether or not you can schedule a meeting with that person. It could be in real life. It could be on Zoom. I find whatever works for you. Uh, I do a lot of meetings on, on Zoom these days. I'm comfortable with it, and we've done a lot of really good business through it as well, and that's just the sign of the times, I think. Um, but some of your clients may not be familiar with that. So it's about understanding what will work for them and what they're comfortable with. Um, once you've done that, again, it's about having that process. So for me, I always go, cool, we've met someone, we qualify them. Once we qualify them, we'll book them in for a um, maybe a bit more of a scoping discovery call, learn what their needs are, their problems are, and, and how that gives me a better idea on how we potentially can help them or, or who else I know might be able to help them. Uh, and then from that, we'll try and list out a plan. This is exactly what we think we can help you with and where we see your future with us. So you're kind of giving them that um, plan. And I think that's, you know, um, Richard, you'll, you'll probably answer better than this than me where you start rolling in all the other things you can do outside of what they came to you for because they're coming to you probably for maybe it's compliance because that's how they've heard of you. Maybe you're doing a really good job of advisory with other clients and that's why they're coming to you. So I think it's also important to know, you know, how they found you, why they're contacting you um, and going through those stages. And if you've got those stages clearly labelled, like I look at everyone I've got in qualification, meeting book, demo books, whatever, and that clearly for me knows what my next actionable step is before I know that a sale can be mm -hmm. can happen or a client actually becomes a client. Um, and, and it's important, I think, to have a structured process like that because uh, it keeps it real and front and center with your client as well. It's not just, it's a good to have an easy conversation with someone, it's comfortable, but at some point you do actually have to sign the dotted line and become a customer. And I think the more you have that structured process, you'll clearly see where people are in your funnel, if you want to call it that, or your sales process. Um, okay. So it's a yeah. good point, Sarah. Smaller firm, obviously, when you're starting out, you handle the inquiries. But as yeah. a firm grows, that's an option. What's your view, Richard, if a firm's larger, should it always be the principal uh, handling that first inquiry? Uh, no, it doesn't have to be. And, and ironically, often big firms are set up with um, a whole uh, cohort of rot wheelers who actually try and keep the humans out of the business. So you have all these PAs and things clustered around partners. It always used to amuse me though, all the all the people we were most scared of in the practice. And um, you know, if someone called up, oh no, you know, because they're very busy, important people, you couldn't actually penetrate the machine to actually um, you know, to pick up that lead. So I, I'm sure a lot of accounting firms lose a lot of business by having this we're too busy to talk to you mentality. So I do think it's really important that you have team leads or managers who can uh, follow the process that, that Trent's talked about. Um, one thing I learned, because when I ran my own practice, you know, it was easy. It was just either me or, or Julie, my wife, who um, was the other partner, uh, who would take the call and, and, and kind of action things. But it comes back a little bit to incentivization as well. I think accounting firms are really poor here. And uh, one thing um, we did, um, not as successfully as we could have, but it's, it's certainly coming into the profession more, is having... Uh, people incentivized to take leads, triage them, and do the sale kind of end to end. And I think that's your kind of your team lead, aspiring people in the, in the business, um, and incentivize them to do that because otherwise, why would they, you know, they don't care. So I learned that in the big firm, I kind of tried to set this uh, process up, and they, uh, the partners weren't keen because, of course, it meant coin going out. But what I missed was that the team leaders didn't want it because it was giving them, if they actually sold something, they had to do more work. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got this kind of weird thing going on. Um, but definitely um, it, it shouldn't be the partners are going to hold it up. And often the partners mm. are the ones who are busy. They can't give the, the time to that person. And they're probably not, not going to be good at listening. They're probably going to be the alpha going Ch -ch 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 -ch, um, and yeah. not listening. So I, I, would push it, I would push it down unless you're a boutique selling yourself as I was and uh, mm -hmm. back in the day Steph was and Guy Pearson, you know, we, we, originally people wanted us, but then over time, if you're going to grow, you've got to share the, the sales love. Yeah, absolutely. I see it as a workflow, really. Um, and clearly, when you're starting out, handle it yourself. But uh, 
couple little stories that I've seen on this process. I remember um, we were running a training webinar on how to handle the front end of the sales process. And we've got this very clear structure. We've got a structure that how to do it if you are the principal or how to do it if you're a support team member. Uh, they're 80% the same, but they're slightly different. And there was a, a gentleman from a regional firm, Alan, his name was, and in the Q&A section, he, um, session, he just went, no, we refuse to screen calls. And I said, okay, uh, we're not talking about screening calls. In that he said, no, all calls have got to be put straight through to me. He'd been through some sales training in the mid-90s mm -hmm. that said never screen calls, always take calls through, which I like the thinking behind that. But then uh, I said, well, this is actually about just finding out about them and seeing if there's a fit. You know, the word qualify was used earlier. I really like the word fit because it's kind of like neutral because it's mm -hmm. not about whether they – are good enough or not sometimes they just don't fit right so it is about that and it's just a conversation with them before you go to the point of booking a meeting i think one of the worst things people can do is someone calls up and says i think about getting a new accountant and the person that takes the call books that meeting straight away that's one of the hardest sales meetings anyone is ever going to have um but anyway alan back to alan he uh, contacts me a few weeks later and goes hmm, mc i think i'm coming around um, because I must take those calls. We had a lead come through uh, yesterday and they were put on hold waiting for me. By the time I went there, they were gone. And I said, well, how long did you keep them on hold? He said, oh, I don't know how many minutes it was. Minutes. <laughs> you know, one minute on hold feels like, you know, 15 minutes on hold. And we then taught him a process where his support team and anyone who can hold a conversation has a structured set of questions to ask that can be put up um, like on the wall or partition, you know, near them so they can see them. But also you put fields in your CRM to just quietly enter the answers to those questions. Like, how did you hear about us? And can I ask, you know, why are you looking to switch mm -hmm. accountants? And uh, so are you in business and how long have you been? There's a whole bunch of factual things that by the end of that conversation, the person calling thinks that they just had a good chat but it's a really good brief and you can establish fit. And when the other person who's not the advisor takes that call, it'll, it allows them, if it's done well, to position that advisor really well for that meeting. So not everyone has to do that way, but we find, particularly if the partners are bottlenecks, if you can train up a mature team member to handle those inquiries, they'll in many ways handle it better than an advisor mm -hmm. who might also fall into a common trap of advising off the cuff on that first inquiry. It's, it's really important to um, in the in the really early stages of that call coming in or the or the inbound off your website to not prejudge. Um, I had a really good question the other day on another webinar I did about what do you do with all these micros that come in. Um, my whole practice was built on micros. You know, I went to an incubator, and they're all startups. And okay, I had to discount and do you know do some free stuff, but. It's about attitude, so I think triaging for the right things. So therefore, there is some training around getting the right questions and the right people across this. Because if you've got a startup with not much money, but they have an ambition to be a worldwide, um, you know, phenomenon or the best of breed in their country, you've probably got someone who's really well placed for advisory right from the get go. They'll need a business plan. They'll need a forecast. They're probably going to raise capital, etc. So one of the other things I do find accounting firms misjudge is um you know they they will often gravitate towards a conservative family group who who are who are cost conscious and stuck in their ways rather than the young squeaky startup who ultimately could be the next big thing so yeah i've heard it before as well like at some point you know your clients might be micro but you could be the difference that actually allows them to be you know a grade and b grade clients over the space of a couple of years so yeah. even um like you kind of need to qualify them yourself to gauge where they're at and whether if they're the type of person that you can work with where you can help shape mold the, the direction and future of their business and i think yeah. even for me i get a i'm sure you all you do all do as well but like you often get in random inquiries on linkedin about a whole bunch of stuff some of it might be junk and most of it generally sometimes is, but I generally will always take the time to respond back to most of it just to really pressure check and gauge what it is before I discount yeah. it because it's very easy because of how much crap does come in <laughs> that I automatically think, oh, this is going to be rubbish. But yeah. the amount of good things, you know, you kind of have to sift through to find the gems every now and then. You can't do that if you have a blanket approach to all of it. Um, yeah. So I think that, that – qualifying piece is really um, cool and that's something that anyone can do it's just you know tell me about your business what are the challenges you've got how did you hear about us or why you know why are you coming to us yeah. those three questions really quickly 
will help you put that person into one form of a bucket. Mm. Um, and I think within that, you'll have then a good strategy or, you know, show on, okay, cool, well, this is what we've done with other people. Um, this is what we can do for you. You know, are you interested in having a, I don't know, 15 to 30 minute uh, consultation with our partner or a specialist or business consultant, whatever it may be? Um, we, yeah. we had a guy who came to us, um, kind of a, he's a lovely guy, but a bit kind of bumbling personality, and he started this business, and it was kind of going nowhere, and we gave him some advice. We, had a, we kind of had him on for a couple of years, and I reckon a lot of firms would have turned him away. He didn't give off the right vibe, a little bit cost-conscious, et cetera. I read about him the other day, literally two days ago, on on um, on the internet, and he's in the States running a $130 million business. <laughs> so I thought, shit um and and they're, they're out there eh? and i think um a lot of it is you know <laughs> god take that call um triage it right you know dig 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 down ask the right questions and i used to ask open questions so where, where do you want this relationship to go because i'm all about having a strategic relationship with my clients that's where they go things like actually i'm moving to san francisco in six months to do x or y um so yeah i think a lot of accounting firms are getting there on this but still Still, there's a little bit of an attitude of these phone calls from outsiders are an intrusion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, seen as an interruption <laughs> rather than an yeah. opportunity. And how lucky yeah. are we in business these days that you know when someone makes an inquiry, and often these days it does come through like a contact us submission, right, through a website for a lot of firms. You've got their email address, you've got their name. It only takes 10 minutes to Google them. Have a look through LinkedIn, see their work history, and yeah. enter all of that into your CRM and notes, you know, have a field in your CRM under each contact record for, you know, their LinkedIn profile link, you know, and and other social like Facebook and Twitter. Some of your CRMs will do this automatically these days anyway. Like we've been using and rolling at HubSpot recently, which I'm a big fan of at the moment. Like, and as soon as I've got their email address, and as long as it's in a Gmail or whatever, it's automatically pulled through and said, here's the company, here's other people that might be in the company, here's the LinkedIn stuff, here's their annual revenue turnover potentially. And it's like, I can do a lot with this, all just with their email. Address. I wish I could, you know, I'm only talking 10 years ago, but I wish I could discover now, kind of at the drop of it, we use HubSpot, um, that spotlight. And, and the intel you can get like that now is incredible. You can make decisions pretty quickly. Now, guys, we might do one more poll. We've got another 17 minutes up. I'm really interested in this. It, the answers to this will fascinate me. And the question is, when have you and your team last been trained in sales? So I'm just going to publish that poll now. So if everyone could again take part in this. Recently, within the last year, over two years ago, over five, over ten, or never. And we'll keep that poll going. Please do vote I can hear the crickets now. chirping already. Can you guys? There's no right or wrong here. We just want to know the lay of the land. Um, Now, one last thing on this front end of the sales process, then we'll move along, is my view of that first conversation, apart from establishing fit, is to sell them on your sales process. And I'll just explain what I mean by that. You don't use the word sales process, the phrase, but your goal of that is to let them know what the next steps are. Because when someone's buying professional services, in their past, it might have been like buying this amorphous blob of help, this ticking clock, like it didn't have any structure around it. And structure really does comfort people. So what we teach people in that first conversation to bring up during uh, you know, that conversation of questions is to say, by the way, if after this initial chat we think it's worth going further, do you mind if I take a moment to explain the three-step process that we guide people through when they're thinking about working with us? And if you need to put a name on it, we use the word evaluation process. So to evaluate a fit and then explain what those steps are. That works really well because people go, great, they want to follow that. I never explain it in any more than three steps. And then the next step is to my view, and it works extremely well, is to get them to do a quick diagnostic after that call, but before you meet with them. Um, We've taught many firms uh, how to do that. And that allows you to it impresses them with the technology because you can embed a web form from HubSpot, Infusionsoft, um, Active Campaign, whichever CRM system you're using, onto a branded web page on your website that people fill in. They tell you all sorts of information and they finish that and they go, well, these guys are pretty tech savvy for starters. And hey, some of those questions were pretty interesting. Then when you have the meeting, it allows you to talk about that information and the gaps between where they are now and where they want to be, not to go into a fairly common 
in my experience, approach to sales meetings where the advisor is trying to impress them with how smart they are and their tax structuring advice. And I've seen people shopping around for accounting firms get advice on the whiteboard off on the fly with all of the diagrams about the different companies and trust structures. And then they think, I wonder what the next accountant will advise. And you just turn them into like structure shoppers, which is tragic in every way. Um, so what's your view, guys, on having um, that process of gathering some more info after that? After the first chat? I think you're going to go through that process if you obviously you see a potential there. And it's just, I think if you're trying to request more information so that you can make better assessment and better judgment on who they are and where you think you're going to help them. Um, obviously, you're not going to request it if you don't think they're a good fit or you don't think you're going to help them with anything. Oh, sure. Yeah, that's assuming you've both established that it's worth exploring it further. Yeah, and I think um, realistically, you're collecting that information to make your onboarding, to, if they do become a customer, even easier again because you're saying, okay, cool, you know, knowing that I'm going to need X, Y, and Z, you can start to build systems around that because that is repeatable, um, easy, and can be managed um, if you do set it up properly. So um, it just, yeah, like I said, you're requesting more info because you need you need it before you can make better judgment um, on what you're going to offer and bring to their business. Just my view, I guess. Sure. Richard? I, I didn't take that approach really because I found if, it, if there was any steps that relied on the client coming back, homework, so to speak, and I know that's not quite what you're talking about, but I mean, I, I, would, I would ask the questions and try and get that fit sorted and, and the triage done pretty quickly and then um, you know impress them by a fast turnaround and, and normally have a coffee uh, you know it, it's a slightly different world you know we were much more kind of local even 10 mm. years ago than we are now um, obviously I'd zoom or something as well now um, but I would find that personal rapport was often quite important so if, they, if they'd got, got through the right hurdles from the questions we could help and it was me I'd, I'd go and have a coffee and I wouldn't I certainly would be really careful around that because you'd you do definitely get those ones who want all the advice in that first hour and you'll never see mm. them again, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah, so um, I, I just, I think anywhere where there's something that will slow the process up, allow, for me, speed was actually important. Other accountants mm. will get in eventually. They might take a week or two, but if you've given someone lots of homework to do, um, web forms are obviously a lot easier now. Um, that could be a point of friction. So, yeah, not sure on that one. Mm. Well, um, it, you need to, my view on it is tested. Um, not every process works for every firm, but when it works in that first conversation, you basically explain the benefits to the person of doing it before the meeting. Cause you say that'll allow us to really hit the ground running when we're together and really drill down into the core issues straight away. So you've got to sell them again on the benefit of doing it. Yeah. Not if they see it as work, that's obviously a bad thing. But um, you know, there's a firm, uh, Ben Walker in Brisbane, his firm's called Inspire, yep. inspire.business. And he came to us, he, he's been through our marketing training program as has Harvey um, Penne there uh, when he was with Change GPS. And he said, MC, we put out six proposals last month and we haven't converted any of them. We're calling them, leaving messages, emailing them. I've just turned into a proposal chaser. What are we doing wrong? And there were three things in his sales process that were missing. Uh, including that first conversation, including a diagnostic, and including what I call live collaborative scoping, which we'll talk about in a moment. And he implemented, he's really great at implementing advice. He just listens and goes and does it. And then he did that. And then the next month he put out five proposals and converted all of them in that month. So this methodology when it's done well is great because he's saying, yeah, I get this email, that web form gets submitted, email comes through summarizing, and I have an amazing understanding of this firm and I haven't even sat down with them. So then when they sit down with them, he can immediately show his understanding of where they're at. And then it pretty much moves into scoping pretty quickly. They're pre-sold is the main point there. Let's have a look at the uh, poll results, hey? When have you and your team been trained in sales 40 percent have never been formally trained in sales process and i'll come back to that recently a third of you within the last 12 months and 17 percent over two years ago were the top three now don't you think everyone it's somewhat paradoxical if we throw our minds back half an hour what the number one response was in your challenge in the sales process the number one response was communicating the value of your advisory services and 40% of you have never been formally trained in, in sales process. So I take that as a takeaway, get some sales training because you might think, oh, but 
And by the way, the reason I relate to this so strongly is, you know, I've got um, a few degrees, got an MBA, don't hold that against me. And I used to think before I got trained in sales, that sales was for someone who dropped out of school early and didn't go to university. That's, you know, that's who people did sales. I was just oh, so happy to is it sad that that's actually what happened? <laughs> you know, I just thought sales is beneath me, right? And then at Business Fitness, um, we had the the uh, sales training for the team. And we got this guy, he's a good guy, Stuart, his name was. And um, it was incredible the difference that it made to the organization's effectiveness. The guys are already really smart people, but they didn't understand sales process. So guys, any of you who answered never been formally trained in sales process, Put it on your training agenda for you know first quarter next year for sure. The um, the, the irony there, MC. We, we've just done a survey of three hundred spotlight firms. Um, so they guys are already doing advisory in, in different shades and, and shapes, and pretty much all of them are saying, "Yep, we're underway. We're monetizing to a certain extent, but there's much more we need to do, and there's gaps in the armory." And so even even at the progressive end of the market, where um, you know this this poll group will be the same probably. Uh, they know that they're doing okay, but they need to do more. They need to invest more. Um, and it's probably the sales training that's the most obvious gap that kind of leaps out at you. So and it's, it's, it's a journey it. towards awareness, isn't it? I think the writing's on the wall, right? Like, I mean, I think everyone's on this um, this session because they want to learn more about this sort of stuff anyway. So I think, um, for, and I think you said there's a lot more. There is a lot more coaching popping up these days for accounting firms and all that sort of stuff for, for that reason, I guess. So I don't know. I mean, MC, do you, this is something you guys help with, right? Like that's part of your services at yeah. Paradox in yeah. terms of sales coaching and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, we've um, refined a sales methodology and there's a couple of flavors of it that we teach firms based on whether they're a small one or two, three person firm or a larger firm. So yeah, we've got um, Nikki Miklos Woodley, who's one of our preferred partners and we run a masterclass, a two-day workshop on sales process once a year, and we deliver it online on demand whenever people need it. Um, I've just had a look uh, in the, the chat area, and let's just have a look here. Um, Peter said, am I alone in finding role play with peer group harder than one-on-one -on -one with clients? <laughs> yeah, yeah, can feel a little bit uh, uncomfortable, but I think once you do it a few times, it becomes normal. Just buy a tripod that stays in the office. That you don't take home for the kids' sport on the weekend because then when you turn around to go use it uh, in the office, it'll be gone. Um, and just get used to videoing uh, role plays. You know, at um, one firm called Change Accountants and Advisors, we help them from start up when they split away. They were a two partner firm. Timothy Munro started out fresh. And we trained, her name was Aston, and she was their client services coordinator. And we role played how to do the initial needs analysis, which is the structured first conversation. We role played it and we role played all of those questions that people think are objections, like what's your hourly rate? Like things like that are actually a buying signal and prospects often just don't know what else to ask. So we role played all those hairy questions and we role played the structure and we role played her selling me as the prospect on the next step, two steps in the process and videoed it, put it in the wiki and then she was handling it. And why we did it with her is Tim had become a bottleneck. He was one of the people that um, had the mess phone messages to get back to, and then they were. To me, a sales lead's like a loaf of bread. It's fresh for a couple of days, and after that, not so good. Absolutely. The whole role play thing's interesting. Um, again, coming back to Steph, she normalized it, which I think was a genius. I think doing it every every week, just as part of what you do, uh, was really cool. I mean, at, at Spotlight, we have this customer success cohort that are all really experienced people in the industry who go out and work alongside our our super VCFO subscribers, and we do role play. And um, I unashamedly take the role of the grumpy accountant. Many of my team, of course, think I am a grumpy accountant anyway. Um, and, 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 I, and, I, and I ask all the questions and, and you know, really keep them on their toes. And we have other people in the business who do that too. Um, I just I think it's a great way to do stuff and feedback and really support your team because you're, although it's a bit awkward and a bit uncomfortable, you're also removing that fear that we talked about. Um, at the start, you know, the worst fear in the world of, of kind of interacting with groups of humans. And so... Yeah, it's just practice, isn't it? It's so, good experience. Um, absolutely, you need sales training and you should um, in, invest in the right externals to come in with a fresh view. But role play is something you can do internally. Yeah, beautiful. And uh, we've also facilitated it with firms in other sorts of advisory meetings where you're explaining, you know, a particular strategy, like how to buy property through certain entities, whatever it might be. And then the most experienced person in the firm gets videoed and then 
everyone watches that and then they review it and then they have questions and often the principal on the firm comes back I can't believe I got asked that question because when someone's really experienced they assume stuff it's actually mm. a phenomenon in our knowledge management called the curse of knowledge that when someone's really experienced they're often bad at training it because they just have this intuition they have this experience or they've got something that they learned 20 years ago that they've now done so many times they don't even think you need to teach you know it's common sense it's obvious so the role well, plays are a great way memory. muscle memory right I think my wife always says practice makes permanent and that's a big part of that as opposed to it makes perfect it's like it just becomes part of what you um do and I, I do it now like someone will say something and instantly depending on what it is it'll trigger me to kind of pause and adapt but doing it you know for nearly 10 years you can kind of do that really quickly and a lot of people will kind of look at me like wow you you really jumped into that like pretty seamlessly and I will again if you've done this literally over a thousand times or whatever in the last 10 years um you would get really good at it too <laughs> That's yeah, true. indeed. But you know, when you're experienced, you can sometimes wander away from what works. You know, you kind of can. I um, say at my age, I've forgotten more than I know, sort of thing. <laughs> in that, you've got to have these systems to follow. We've got a tab in our CRM, we use Infusionsoft, and it's called dossier, you know, meaning like a summary of the relationship. And the questions to ask are right there. So, our team, like Alicia Edgar, one of our uh, digital marketing specialists, she's got pretty much everything she needs to ask, but she just has a good chat with the person and finds it out. Um, before we wrap, a couple of things. Um, and I see, Trent, you've replied to Jason in chat. Jason Croston from SRJ, Walker Whalen in Brisbane is wondering, will wearing a black T-shirt help improve my sales process? I said yes. And then I said apparently hats can work too. So um, Takes a yeah. couple of kilos off, I was told. That's the only reason I'm <laughs> The way my hair's going, I might have to move to the Cap Territory. Um, but <laughs> may well do, Jason. Test yeah. and measure and see how you go. Um, now, if anyone's got any last questions, feel free to type them through in that chat area. And what I'm going to do is just let everyone know about a training event. We're talking about training. And this is our next masterclass that's happening in about a month on the Sunshine Coast. Today we talked about briefly at times value proposition. So being able to communicate succinctly, why should someone choose your firm in a way that's not saying we're different in exactly the same way all the other firms are saying we're different. Like, you know, we're more experienced, you know, we, uh, you know, more caring. Yeah, sure. More dedicated, all that sort of um, blah, blah rubbish. So we teach you um, how to get your message right and how to do blogging, social media, video and the like. So uh, that's just on screen where the polls were. If anyone wants to click through and join us for that. Um, okay. So any parting advice, I'll frame it up so you can each think this through to everyone who's with us now. What's one actionable thing that everyone can do in the coming week to a specific act, a specific behavior they can do to improve their sales process or their sales results? I'd say, right. oh, yeah, you right, go. I was gonna say, just to start with yourself, I think look to what, what process uh, do you adopt? Are you kind of leading by example? Um, and and uh, particularly if you're in a smaller firm, um, you know, how efficient are you? Are you going to, if, if if you think of some of your peers in the industry and a, a juicy lead comes up, how are you going to win that by, by you know, being human, by having the right script and the right process, speed to response and all of some of the other stuff we've talked about today. So I think physician heal thyself and then you can, you can work on the team. Good advice. Thanks, Richard. Trent. Um, I think it's important to map out what you think your sales process should be. If you don't have one already, I know, I think you said you've got a template for this as well, MC, but um, just keep it really simple. Like, client comes in, cool, what needs to happen next? What needs to happen next? And by what stage do you think they will become a customer? Uh, because then, uh, whilst it might feel weird and scripted at first because you're trying to get them, it'll become a really natural flow. Uh, eventually and you're just explaining look this is just how we we want to make sure that you're a good fit for us and that we're a good fit for you so if you don't mind I'd love to ask you a couple of questions about who you are and and what the challenges are you've got and then through that and we do that by you know a meeting we sit down we talk about it or, or whatever whatever it is um, so I think map out your current process if you don't have one chat to experts that you know um, again, I'm not trying to plug you too much, MC, but I'm like, chat to MC. They do this, this is what you guys do for a living. <laughs> That's why we're here. 
And, you know, that's a great tip about documenting the process. It doesn't matter what it is. If it's three boxes joined by a couple of arrows right now, so be it. At least it's documented in a yeah. central place. Hopefully everyone's running some sort of cloud-based, you know, wiki or knowledge base where everyone in your team can see it. Just document it and then you can just evolve it over time. Um, something that I'd just highly recommend everyone too is, you know, the reason we've got the three of us together is because spotlight reporting helps you make the delivery of advisable very scalable many of our, our members of paradox are using it and practice ignition makes that process of doing the proposal and the engagement documentation and then the transition into workflow deployment insanely efficient um, so process is crucial but then have the right tools as well so um, i'll start with you trent if people aren't familiar with practice ignition what's the best way for them to learn more or to get in touch with you definitely so i think um check out practiceignition.com if you're not sure what it is it's obviously been built by well, it might not be obvious been built by um, a cloud accountant um you know pioneer like richard um which was guy um, pearson if you want to chat to me further about it and i will genuinely tell you whether it can work for you or not just trent at practiceignition.com is my email address send me an email we'll have a we'll have a 15 minute chat you'll go into my process where yeah. I evaluate you <laughs> and, and vice versa, um, and and we'll go from there. But that's the point. I you'll genuinely know within that first call whether or not something it'll work for you or not. That's my guarantee. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, Trent. Nice. Richard, what's look, the best way people can find out more about Spotlight Reporting? Yeah, look, spotlightreporting.com. Jump into the Zero Marketplace as well. Look at us. Look at the peer apps um, there. I'm really happy for people to reach out directly to me, Richard, at spotlightreporting.com. I've got great team members in Australia and New Zealand, um, you know, where people are listening to us as well, uh, all discoverable on the website as well. And, and, and we have a process. Um, but, we, no, look, we're really happy to talk to people and, and help be that mechanism that uh, opens up advisory at scale uh, for your practice. Beautiful. And, guys, apart from the masterclass um, information you can see on the side of your screen, if you just want to have a general chat with us about either generating leads or converting them, so marketing or sales, just drop us an email at hello at practiceparadox.com.au and one of our digital marketing specialists will um, have a chat with you and then you can witness uh, our process and see how we do our uh, initial conversation. And just to wrap up, I can see that Rebecca and Alicia have both uh, said some actions they're gonna do. Rebecca is gonna finish her needs analysis question and Alicia shared a tip, if your follow-up sucks, do follow up Friday, block out a time each Friday. Fortune is in the follow up. What a wonderful uh, way to end. Nice. So thank you, Richard, and thank you, Trent, for uh, blocking out time for today and in the prep. Pleasure. Um, I'm sure everyone's uh, got some great takeaways from this that they can put into action. And uh, thanks everyone for joining us today for this webinar all about streamlining your sales process. I'm MC Carter, and I've been joined by Trent McLaren and Richard Francis, and we'll see you for our next webinar. Bye for Thanks, now. guys. Thanks, Thank guys. You. See ya. Ciao.